computer. So hello everyone, I'm Theron Muller in my office at uh, Waseda University's Faculty of Human Sciences at our Tokorozawa campus. And my co-presenter is Beth Oba. Beth? Hi, I'm Beth Oba. I'm at the National Institute of Technology, Kosen Toyama College. And today we're going to be talking about employment precarity in Japanese higher education, um, the changing employment contract length between 2002 and 2022. This is a presentation that's scheduled to be given at the NEAR conference in June of 2024. We are recording this before the conference. However, if you're watching this, you'll be watching it after the conference. So this is kind of our plan for what we're going to say at the conference and kind of a record of what we said so that um, we can hopefully disseminate it between among more people than just uh, me and Beth and the other one person who's going to be in the room in Niigata. Um, so we'll jump into the, oh, and the QR code is a direct link to the presentation slides. So if you want to see the presentation slides separate from the video, just follow that QR code. And wherever I upload this, I'll also try to put a direct link to the slides. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide here. So first, we wanted to acknowledge that it's not just Beth and I who are presenting our research. Um, Dave, Dr. David Begler from Temple University has generally, generally, generously assisted us in being able to get access to the data that we're going to be presenting today. And then um, Everett Morrison, Jason Henwood, and Dr. Julia Kimura um, were part of the team that um, discussed uh, data analysis, and then also did some of the data analysis. And finally, this is a legitimate um, heartfelt thank you to the JREC in Portal people um, who gave us access to the jobs data that we'll be discussing today. Um, they were very generous with their time in terms of uh, getting set up to actually be able to access the data, completing all the forms that needed to be done, and also in helping us answer some of the really basic questions we had about the data after they provided it to us. So um, we are required to say thank you to them and we are also legitimately thankful to them for giving us this opportunity to analyze the data that we'll be sharing with you here. All right, so to start with uh, uh, the literature review, the issue that we're kind of interested in exploring is precarity in higher education employment. And um, the literature generally talks about how employment precarity in higher education has been increasing and is likely to increase. And it has very well documented negative impacts on the lives and livelihoods of those who are precariously employed. So um, probably most of you who are watching this have experienced this for yourselves or know somebody who's experienced it for yourself. But just to make sure that it's clear, the people who are employed part-time or on temporary contracts receive fewer benefits. They have less academic freedom. And um, Mason and Megaron talk about how institutionally they're kind of invisible. They may show, they show up and teach their classes, but beyond that, they don't really have a representation in the university. However, much of the research on this topic, not all of it, but much of it concerns Anglophone university teaching contexts. And so the situation in Japan isn't as well understood, hence this investigation looking at precarity in Japanese higher education. So first of all, please keep in mind, there's a lot of information on the screen. You're not expected to remember all of it. There isn't a quiz in the, at the end and um, you don't need to try to remember all of this. We just want to try to point out what some of the main trends are here. So there's kind of two important pieces of data to keep in mind. And um, this first data is the arrow on the bottom of the screen, which is pointing at those kind of light blue bar lines. And the point there is that is the population of students who are leaving high school year by year, going all the way back to um, uh, about the mid 80s, I think. And so what you can see is that the number of high school students who are finishing their education and graduating 
is either flat or slightly declining over time in recent years. And the other piece of information that's really important is the arrow on the top that's pointing toward that kind of light blue line that says 83.8%. And that's the percentage of high school graduates who are going on to some kind of further education. Um, and so basically the, the point that's being made here is Japan's demographic crisis is such that the number of people who are graduating high school is on the decline. And one way that Japan has made up for it is if you go to the left of the graph, you can see that like back in the 1980s, there weren't 83, 84% of high school graduates going into university or higher education. But what they've done is they've increased the proportion and basically they've saturated all the high school students who can go on to higher education at this point are going on to higher education. However, the population of high school students is going to continue to decline. And so that's basically, that frames the demographic crisis for Japanese universities. Um, they're dealing with fewer students who are able to enroll in the, in the institutions and that's pushing them economically um, to try to hedge their bets, to try to have more precariously employed, more precariously employed uh, people working because they don't know whether they're even going to still be in business in 10 or 20 years, basically. Okay, so the next slide is showing enrollments in different um, institutions. And this is not just high school and university. This covers all the age, range of, age ranges of schooling. And so again, um, some of the important, two of the important pieces of information here are the arrow at the bottom. The arrow at the bottom is pointing to that kind of pink line, which you can see is dropping precipitously. And also that light blue line that's kind of increasing, ex increasing and then starting to um, level off a little bit. Those are the preschool aged children. And so you can see going back in time, um, the peak was somewhere around the early 1980s and the number of children in kindergartens, that pink line has been decreasing ever since. And then they've created, relatively recently, they created a new kind of um, daycare and that's what's increasing and the kindergarten numbers are continuing to go down. So the, the new kind of daycare allows for um, evening schooling or watching kids in the evening as well, which lets working parents work longer. But the point is basically those student numbers are going down. Or, and so you can imagine in 15 years, those are gonna be the same people that are in high school. And since those numbers are going down, that means in 15, 20 years, the people in high school are also going to be um, fewer than they are today. And then the top number is showing the number of people enrolled in universities. Um, and that's the number of people that are enrolled in universities. And you can see how that line was increasing and has now leveled out basically. And so that's again, a sign of the demographic crisis that uh, universities are facing and probably one of the motivations for why they're trying to hedge their bets and rely more on precarious employment than um, full-time employment. Okay, so what are the actual numbers as of 2019? Um, just under 190,000 full-time teachers were employed by Japanese universities and just under 210,000 quote-unquote concurrently employed um, people. The complication with the concurrently employed means that they have a job at, one, at more than one place simultaneously, um, but the Ministry of Education doesn't track whether they are, what that employment is, whether it's part-time or full-time. So it could be that some of those numbers are, they have a full-time job and they also have a part-time job somewhere else. And it could be those numbers are, um, they have part-time jobs at a number of different institutions. So you can imagine, you know, a hypothetical teacher that has say four part-time jobs at four different universities, they've been counted in those numbers four times basically. Um, and then the other asterisk is that that information doesn't include two-year institutions or national colleges of technology. That that information exists. We just didn't add the numbers together. We thought that this would be good enough to make our point here. Um, and the ministry doesn't track uh, contract terms 
or length. So full-time, it's impossible to know whether they're full-time tenured or whether they're full-time on some kind of a limited term contract. So that kind of comes to the point of today's investigation. The full extent of a precarious employment in Japanese higher education remains unclear. And so that's what we're trying to unpack a little bit through the research that we're sharing with you today. I promise Beth has an opportunity to speak very soon here. So uh, <laughs> moving on to the methods of the research, we examined job posting data that was posted to JREC-IN, which is a Japanese government funded job posting site. Um, 2002 is the first available data. So we looked at that year and then 2022 is the most recent full year of available data. So we looked at that. Um, the method we used is document analysis, which involves examining historical data. I think it's important to keep in mind and we'll talk about this when we get into the findings. Historical data doesn't mean objective data. Um, you have to be kind of careful when you're looking at historical data that you keep in mind that you can't see what isn't included in that data. And we'll talk about that when we get into the actual findings. Um, and um, as far as this kind of method, looking at these job listings, to our knowledge, um, the other researcher who's looked at this is Brown, who published his study in 2023, but he concentrated on English medium instruction job listings. And so we're looking at all of the job listings posted to the site um, rather than focusing on one, one kind of uh, job theme. And our research question is, how has employment precarity at Japanese higher education institutions changed between 2002 today, 2002 and today, especially considering the negative influence precarious employment has on education? All right. So I've mentioned precarious employment a number of times in this presentation, and so I thought it'd be important to give a definition of it. Um, so precarious work is kind of the marked version of work where the unmarked version would be stable, permanent, full employment. Um, and so precarious employment means uncertainty regarding the continuity of the work and also the quantity of the work. Um, it also means economic insecurity, um, less power and autonomy, and um, more generally a lack of rights, and in some cases, unsafe working conditions. Um, for universities specifically, um, precarious workers are often undervalued, overused, and stigmatized, um, lacking the capacity to secure an, a permanent position. And so the, this kind of definition that we took from Solomon and Duplice, you can see the citation there. And finally, hopefully I can hand it over to Beth and let her take it from here. Thank you, Vera. Uh, so now we'd like to jump into some of the specifics of our findings. So one of the things that was included in the job advertisement data that we got is whether or not the position advertised had an employment term. So in Japanese, this is ninki ari. And the data we received had columns in it. And if the column had a circle in it, then this was a job with an employment term, with a contract term, ninki ari, or there was an X in the column if there was not. So when we start by looking at the data from 2002, and we can see clearly that 83% of the jobs have no term specified. And then if we jump over to the 2022 data, this number clearly flips. And at that point in time, only 31% of the jobs have no term, whereas almost 70% of the jobs include a term limit in 2022. And then down in the bottom right corner, you can see the numerical data that's represented in the graphs up above. And another thing that we were able to look at in the data that we received was to look at the language that was used in the job advertisements for the 2022 data set only. The 2002 data set was all only in Japanese, and so we weren't able to make these kinds of comparisons. But here for 2022, we were able to look at the differences in terms depending on which language was used in the job advertisement. Uh, so on the slide, you can see clearly we have in Japanese only, and then Japanese and English. And those two look fairly similar, basically, on, on just a first glance. Whereas if you look over at the job advertisements that were in English only, clearly it's quite different. And at that point in time, 95% of the jobs advertised a much higher proportion specified a term. 
Uh, down the bottom again, we can see the numbers for the top pie charts up at the top. I think it's really important to keep in mind that the English only jobs were really a very small proportion of the total jobs that were advertised on the site. Uh, whereas the Japanese only was obviously a much larger proportion. So the number of Japanese only jobs was actually 10 times larger than those advertised in Japanese and English and English only. And I think just to add to what Beth shared here, I just want to kind of clarify that this Japanese only, English only, and the both is kind of an artifact of the way the site is run. It has a Japanese side where if you want to log into the Japanese side, you have your own separate login that's different from the English side. And so the Japanese and English means that they were advertised in both of those databases. The data was available in both of those databases. So if you're somebody logging into the JREC site, unless you log in in Japanese and English simultaneously and you're kind of comparing results, this isn't something you'd necessarily see. This is only something that we could really see because we got the data from them in a kind of spreadsheet format and we could do this comparison. I'll move on to the next slide here. Thank you very much, Darren. That's a very important point. And so there was one final area that we were able to examine in the data as well, which is to look at part-time versus full-time and the term limits. Simultaneously. So again, we have the ninki ari, ninki nashi, and then we could look at part time versus full time. So we were very interested in looking at what changed or what was different regarding the full time or the part time jobs in 2002 and in 2022. And we wanted to look at what changed regarding those between 2002 and 2022. And this is the graphical representation of what we came up with. So if we look first at 2002, you can see here that regarding the full-time jobs, uh, in 2002, 85% of the full-time jobs advertised did not have an employment term. Whereas in 2002, if we look over here at the part-time jobs, 66% had a term specified, and then about 35% had no term specified. So the part-time jobs in 2002 look a lot more like all of the jobs in 2022 than they do the full-time jobs in 2002. And then if we look specifically at the 2022 data, uh, the full-time jobs over here, if we look at those first, had no term specified for about 40% of them and had a term specified for about 60%. But if we look over here at the part-time jobs, Almost all of the part-time jobs had a term specified in 2022. So you can see that obviously the part-time jobs were very different from the full-time jobs in 2022, and they remain different to this day. And we can also see clearly that employment terms crept up to almost include all of the part-time jobs today. And then this chart is showing us the numerical data for the, the graph we were looking at just previously. So if we look specifically in the numbers, uh, first of all, if we start down here in the 2022 part-time jobs, we can see that 23 out of the about 4,800 had no term specified. This is sort of a point that stands out, I think, but I want to come back to that in just one moment. Uh, first of all, if we look at the, the part-time jobs in 2002, as well as 2022, we can see these are really very small numbers compared to the whole general amount of jobs that are being advertised. So I think based on this in historical data analysis, we can say that basically the JREC Insight is not being used to advertise most of the part-time jobs. Certainly back in 2002, it was not being used to, to advertise the majority, but even now in 2022, I think it's safe to say that 5,000 is really only a small proportion of all of the part-time jobs that are available at Japanese universities. And so one caveat to keep in mind is that we, we don't really, we probably haven't captured the full picture of jobs on offer at Japanese universities. Another caveat to keep in mind with this data is that this Ninki Ari is a radio button on the website. So when an institution is uploading the job posting to the JRECN website, there's just a button that they push if there's ninki ari or nachi, if there is a term limit or not. So although I would think in all of the job postings that go up, human error, clerical error is probably a very small percentage of all that goes up. If we go back again to this 2022 part-time data, no term limit for these 23, 
I think it's possible to imagine that in fact, a good proportion of these may in fact be clerical error. Uh, and then there's one other point that we'd like to just make sure that you keep in mind when we look at this. We are looking only at the jobs being advertised on the website. It's possible that the employees are actually getting different terms once they are hired by an institution, but we're simply looking at the language, the way the job is being presented by the university to prospective applicants using the JRACIN website. Uh, and now, well, there, pass the floor back to you. Thank you. Anything else to add here also? Yeah, I think the one other thing I'll add is that the Ninki Adi, it's never, it's not clear to us whether that means it's a one year contract that's renewable indefinitely, or if it's, um, say, three years and you have to be out. So it just means that there's a term. And the, it doesn't, there's the, the data that we're examining here doesn't let you know what that term is, which is a really nice way to transition into this next little bit of, um, data that we're going to talk about. So when we started, the title of this presentation was to look at changing contract lengths. And that's actually when we started what we were hoping to be able to get the data for. However, the answer we got back from JREC in was they didn't have that data to share with us from 2002. And from 2022, they could share that text field with us. But in order to actually check what the term was, there wasn't really an automated way to examine it. You kind of had to go through by brute force by hand and see what terms were being advertised and examine those by hand. And so what we ended up doing was we took a subset of 100 jobs out of the original 23,000, and we looked at those um, to see which had terms. And we also tried to figure out what those terms were. And so, um, sorry, I lost Beth here, which I wasn't expecting, but I'll keep going here. So um, out of those 100, out of those 100, um, there were basically 81 had terms and 19 out of the 81s that had the term or had the Ninki Adi mentioned a clear maximum term. And so this is the breakdown of the 19. And um, some who are familiar with Japanese labor law might be a bit surprised to see the 11 year number there. I can assure you, I double checked that. It really was 11 years, which surprised me as well. Um, and so you can see nine out of the 19 had five, a five year maximum. And then the next most popular was three. And then there was one each of four. Um, I wanna, be clear here, this is a conservative number um, because if it said possibility of renewal, I didn't count that. I only counted jobs that said five years maximum. So um, in terms of doing this research in the future, there's the possibility of thinking about trying to get a conservative number and a less conservative number but I thought this kind of gave us the information we needed at least for now to think about um, to think about how to carry this research forward into the future. Okay, so this is a summary of our findings. Um, precarious employment measured by positions advertised with terms has increased considerably between the 2002 and 2022. Um, jobs advertised only in English include a much higher proportion of limited employment terms than jobs advertised in only Japanese or both Japanese and English. And in 2022, part-time jobs almost exclusively included limited term employment. Whereas in 2002, there were more part-time jobs with limited employment terms than without, there were still part-time jobs without limited employment terms. And then um, my plan was for Beth to present this part of the presentation, but um, it looks like she dropped out of the Zoom call. So I'll fill this in for her. So what we're looking for in the future is for this kind of preliminary analysis, we just used the 2002 and the 2022 data. So analysis of the full data would allow us to better understand how these changes happened over time and how they may reflect historical policy changes 
so for those of you that are that are aware, in uh, 2008, employment law changed, and in 2013, um, there became this kind of five years to permanent employment rule in Japan. And so how that rule ends up reflecting changes to contract terms, it looks like Beth is back here. So how that rule ends up uh, reflecting changes to contract terms is one thing that we're interested in investigating. And then Beth, if you're kind of ready, I'll, I'll leave that second point to you, the qualitative research one. Uh, yes, sure. At this preliminary, I'm not entirely sure what Theron has said. I apologize for disappearing for a moment, but this was really just a preliminary analysis, which was very much quantitative for us. And so we just looking at the job advertisements themselves uh, has been very interesting, but we really do want to dive into it a bit more. There has been research done outside of Japan about the impact of education quality on, of precarious workers but there has not been as much done in Japan. Uh, Witsa did do a doctoral dissertation on this topic, and so that's one instance, but we really do think that this is worth trying to do some more qualitative research follow-up and try and link the increase of precarity of employment to impacts on education quality and educational outcomes. Uh, there, is there anything else you'd like to add? I think that's everything. So thank you very much, everybody. These are our references, which you can access if you visit the presentation online. And with that, I think we will stop the recording if I can figure out how to do that.